Greetings and welcome back to room 303 of the Harvard Classics Lectures. This is lecture number 66, Euripides' Hippolytus. Um, we are in volume 8 of the Harvard Classics and we are studying nine different Greek dramas. We'll be working now with our third of the really influential Greek tragedy writers. This one, um, our, he is the youngest of the three. Maybe the most loved, certainly we would argue the most controversial, right? We're going to do um, two of Euripides' plays. In this lecture we'll be doing Hippolytus, and then in the next lecture we'll do what many have called the, the greatest uh, play and the last great play of uh, Greek theater, the Bacchae. Now, um, if you haven't been following my lectures, I recommend that you go to learnstrong.net and you go down that left-hand side and find the Harvard Classics Lectures and for sure take a look at lecture number 59, which is my intro lecture to Greek drama. Then in lectures 60 through 62, I did um, Aeschylus' Oresteia, and then in 63, I did Aeschylus' Prometheus Bound. Then in 64, I did Oedipus Rex, and 65, I did Antigone. And now, we turn in lecture 66 to the third of our great writers, Euripides. It's always fascinating to talk to people who kind of, uh, you know, enjoy Greek theater and Greek drama and have studied it and read it and that kind of thing, to ask questions like, of the three, which do you think is your favorite or the most influential and why? Of all the plays that we have available to us of these three great writers, which one for you is, the, is your favorite and why are the most controversial and why are the most influential and why? You'll notice that several times in these lectures I've said things like, this may be the most, you know what I mean? Um, and we're going to take a look now at Hippolytus. I'm sure it was difficult for Dr. Eliot as he made his selections of the nine Greek plays that he would select for this volume to bypass uh, Euripides' classic text Medea and go to the text Hippolytus. And we'll have maybe something to say about that. By the way, I've also given, um, when I uh, did my lectures on Edith Hamilton's mythology, I've given in Lecture 7 a more full rendering of the history and the life of, um, of um, Thetis um, and, um, and, 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 and of Theseus, the, the father of, of, Hippolyta, of Hippolytus. And, uh, and, and if you want, you can go and you can find that on Learn Strong as well, and that can maybe help you. Now, just to remind we always begin with an identification of our learning theory here. Just to remind, we in 303 define learning as the capacity to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways. That for us is always significant when we are reading, and therefore we're always following our kind of annotative understanding of three levels of reading. Level one, what does the text say? Summary. Level two, what does the text mean? Here at 2A, we, we look for themes, messages at 2B, the rhetoric, not what Euripides says, but how Euripides says it. We're going to concentrate, as we've done in all of our other lectures on Greek drama, we're going to concentrate on two things. We're going to look at symbols that are significant for us, and we're going to concentrate on the conflict that is clearly a part of, of, of our study. Then at level three, and most importantly, because of the way we define learning as connecting or matching or relating new information to old information. We're going to ask, how can I relate to this text, the 3A, how can I relate this text to other texts that we've studied um, and to the life in general? And then finally at 3B and most importantly, and it, as I've done in all of my prior lectures with you guys, I'm trying to give you some sense of how you can relate to this text. I think some of you will find that of all the texts we've studied thus far that we call Greek drama, you may find that this is the one that lends the most easily to your ability to say, been there, done that, in some, in, in some way, okay? So let's turn now to Euripides. Uh, we're going to, as I said, deal with this text, um, um, Hippolytus, in, in this lecture, and then we're going to do the Bacchae in the next lecture. So it makes sense for us to take a few notes really quickly about this third of the great Greek writers. His date's 480 to 406. Think about this. He dies seven years, roughly, before his, his pal, Socrates, um, is killed. We talked about Socrates in earlier Harvard Classics lectures when we did Plato's Apology. There's always been a question about who was this loner? Was he a loner? Did he just like solitude? For example, he takes his large library, moves to a cave, and that's where he lives much of his life. Um, was he a woman hater? Okay, a misogynist. I mean, clearly we're going to get into that one when we get into this play. And yet, at the same time, we're going to point out that Euripides has this tendency to represent, especially his female characters, 
in profound ways. I mean, we think about Medea at the end of that play as she is killing her own children to get back at her, at her ex-lover, Jason. Or in this play, when we meet in this play, almost all of the action of the play is carried on by women. We'll begin with the goddess Aphrodite, we'll end with the goddess Artemis. In between, we will see the heartbroken Phaedra, who is the uh, maybe most tragic uh, of, of women, uh, and then of course her nurse as well. And they carry pretty much all of the action, with the exception of uh, Hippolytus and his father Theseus. Um, we know about Euripides that he was an athlete who turned writer at the age of 25. Um, he, started, he started writing. He had a couple of bad marriages, which is why some people say that maybe he had a really strong disdain for women. Some people have seen Shakespeare, remember that line from Hamlet, frailty, thy name is woman, and all of that. Shakespeare's loathing of women Back, coming back in some ways to his study of Euripides, we'll you know we'll we'll maybe have more to say about that at the end of this at the end of this one. For 50 years though, Euripides writes only five of his plays end up first place. Of the 92 plays that he published and uh, uh, performed, only 19 sadly 18 to 19, depending on how you count, uh, survive, and that obviously is sad. However, many people who study this. Uh, and like to make these kinds of inclusive types of observations will say, Euripides may be the most tragic and the most influential for modern drama. I, I think probably, honestly, that you would have to say Euripides is maybe the most significant when we look at writers like Shakespeare uh, on down the line. In some ways, you could argue that Euripides, he is the youngest of the three, first Aeschylus, then Sophocles, and finally Euripides. It's possible that Euripides really does bring an end to the high watermark of Greek drama, especially with his text, the Bacchae, that we'll talk about in our next lecture. He is, many have argued, the humanist who really does in his plays reject simple answers, and he forces audience members to deal with that fear and pity that Aristotle claimed in his poetics was the most important thing that happens in plays. Certainly we're going to see that played out here in a play in the Hippolytus, which is really not a very complicated play at all. In fact, we can summarize all of the action of this play, first performed in 428 BCE and won first prize. This is a pretty e easy play. Aphrodite has it out for Hippolytus. Why? Because Hippolytus has no interest in women. The way Aphrodite goes about doing this tragically, however, is uh, through uh, Hippolytus' stepmom, Phaedra, and through a series of events. Phaedra will die, Hippolytus will die, and Theseus, the king uh, and the father of, of Hippolytus, will be destroyed. Sounds somewhat like Greek, Greek drama. At the very end of the play, Athena will come on stage to basically let um, um, uh, father and son both know this is just the way things have worked out because of Aphrodite. So let's go to work now with the play. We'll work at level one. We'll go through the play at level one and then we'll talk level two and level three. We are in Trojan at the beginning of the play. Aphrodite is the one to speak and she says it this way. Great among men and not unnamed am I. The Cyperian in God's inmost halls on high. And wheresoever from Pontus to the far red west men dwell and see the glad day star and worship me, the pious heart I bless, and wreck that life that lives in stubbornness, for that there is, even in a great God's mind, that hungereth for the praise of humankind. Now, two things. She says, I am a great goddess, and everyone knows who I am, the goddess of love and beauty, of course, as we think about it. And, of course, we know about Aphrodite through the Judgment of Paris stories that began ostensibly the Trojan War and all of that because Paris decides he needs to run off and find Helen because of the, uh, the help of Aphrodite. Aphrodite is a fascinating goddess, as I have said in my Hamilton Mythology lectures, and here she says it. I am the greatest goddess and I punish stubbornness and she says I am a god like all gods who desire worship and reverence. Now you can of course go back to our Harvard Classics lectures on uh, Milton and Paradise Lost 
where it seems that something similar is being suggested by Milton's God there, or towards Milton's God, the need for worship, the need for reverence and for praise. And this is exactly what Aphrodite says. She says then that she is aware that Hippolytus is not interested in her. And in fact, Hippolytus is interested in spending all his time going out, running through the woods and hunting with Artemis. And I, I, Aphrodite basically says, I've had enough of it. She says, I don't grudge that he likes to hang out with Artemis, nor grudge no I, nor hate. She says, yet, seeing that Hippolytus hath offended, I this day shall smite Hippolytus. Long since my way was open, nor needs now much labor more. In other words, she says, I've been working on this project for a while. Watch me as I destroy Hippolytus. Now, this is significant, and it will remind us somewhat of this, the biblical story of Job, where in the beginning of the story we learn two things. One, Job is an, a righteous man, upright before God. He's done nothing wrong. And two, he's going to get jacked. Um, in our story here, Hippolytus will end up dead at the end. And we're told right at the very beginning that Aphrodite has a reason for doing this, and it's as simple as this. She's jealous that Hippolytus has no interest in love, no interest in women, and all he cares about is running out through the woods and going hunting. Now, of course, we live in a place where we understand that every once in a while you will hear someone, a guy especially, say, I'm not interested in having a girl, I'm interested in going hunting through the fall months. Well, welcome to Hippolytus. There you go. This is Hippolytus. He's got no interest whatsoever, and so we're going to have we're going to have the project set up right at the very beginning. By the way, this is a very simple play in that regards. It's a very simple play in that Aphrodite says, I'm jealous. I'm going, to jack this, I'm going to jack this kid. Watch me do it. And I've already set this up because I have already made his stepmother, uh, Phaedra, fall in love with him. Now, he doesn't know that. But Phaedra is totally consumed in passion for her stepson. And because that's the case, this is a pretty easy gig. All I have to do is just now work out the last bits, right? Well, um, oh, just to give a little bit of background, and I've done this again in the Hamilton, in, in the Hamilton mythology lectures, Theseus has taken, um, the king of Athens, has taken um, uh, a, a Amazonian, Amazonian uh, queen um, um, in um, Hippolyta as his wife. He has a son with her. His name is Hippolytus. Um, she then is gone, and now he has a new wife named Phaedra. So Phaedra is the new wife of Theseus and, of course, is the stepmother to uh, Hippolytus. And Hippolytus, to this point, has shown absolutely no interest whatsoever towards his stepmother. Again, all he does is he likes to go out and run through the woods and go hunting, right? Hippolytus then will come on straight stage for the first time. He will show full um, respect to, there's two uh, statues there, one of Artemis, one of Aphrodite. He doesn't even look at Aphrodite's statue. He looks immediately and shows all of his, all of his love and his obeisance is made for Aphrodite. To this degree, uh, uh, Aphrodite is ready to set it up. So as he comes on stage for the first time, she finishes her speech by saying, but soft, here comes Hippolytus, striding from the chase, our prince Hippolytus. I will go my ways, and hunters at his heels, and a loud throng glorifying Artemis with praise and song. Little he knows that hell's gates opened are, and this his last look on the great day star. In other words, this will be his last day. Now that is significant, because right from the very beginning, Euripides wants his audience to know this is a play about a guy that's about to get jacked. But what's fascinating is that this play is really not about Hippolytus. It is really about Phaedra. And it's really about the passion that she feels, but she can't help but feeling because, of course, Aphrodite has sent her the fire of love, as we will hear about it. Well, um, the, onto the stage will come, um, uh, will come Hippolytus. He will show proper obeisance only to Artemis. And he has a huntsman pal who says to him, you know, you might want to be careful about just showing your obeisance and your respect only to Artemis. You know, you should probably show respect to all of the gods, and you shouldn't be too proud. Hippolytus says about Aphrodite, I greet her from afar, and then he says it, my life is clean. 
Let's put it in our notes. Hippolytus is very, very proud of the fact that he's got no interest in sex. He is sworn to chastity. The, the huntsman, however, will say, clean, nay, proud, proud, a mark for all to scan. In other words, you're a bit self-righteous here, he says to the young man. You like to let everybody know that you've got no interest in being with a woman. You've got no interest in it at all. That is to say, all you're interested in is chastity and chastity and going out for the hunt. And then Hippolytus will say, these spirits that reign in darkness like me not, which is, of course, an ironic line because Aphrodite's about to jack him. And the huntsman finally will say it. What the gods ask, O son, that man must pay. Now, this is, of course, one of the central messages of all of these Greek plays, isn't it? Uh, remember, all of these plays are being performed, not for entertainment's sake, first and foremost, right? They're being performed for the Dionysian festival, which is a religious festival. And what is at the heart of the religious festival? You better rever reverence and obey and show proper obeisance to the gods. And here, of course, we'll hear the same thing. The next phase, the next movement in the play, along with the chorus, is Phaedra. Poor Phaedra, her nurse, who is wanting to help her. Think about Juliet and Romeo and Juliet's nurse, and the chorus. And all of them are trying to figure out what's wrong with Phaedra. Well, what is wrong with Phaedra when she comes on stage? She can barely stand up. It looks as if she not only is going to die, but she wants to die. And she will, in fact, begin to speak with the chorus as well as with the nurse who are both trying to figure out what in heaven's name is wrong with you. I mean, it's clear that Phaedra is ill. It's clear that something's wrong with Phaedra. She will say things like, my hand is clean, but is my heart, O oh God? And then the nurse will say, what? Speak. What is this death fraught mystery? And then Phaedra will say, I am lost. I am lost. Well, exactly what's going on here is that ultimately she will have to admit that there's, there's a passion that is consuming her. The nurse finally will say something about Hippolytus and then Phaedra will immediately demonstrate that that's who she is in love with. The nurse is at first appalled, then the nurse will begin to give her some words of advice. And ultimately, her words of advice go something um, like this. A straight and perfect life is not for man. Uh, uh, and, and then she continues by saying, Nay, my dear daughter, Phaedra, cast thine evil, or cease thine evil mind, cease thy fierce pride, for pride it is, and blind to seek to outpass gods. Love on and dare a god hath willed it. And since pain is there, make the pain sleep. Songs are there to bring calm and magic words, and I will find the balm, be sure to heal thee. Else in sore dismay, where men could not, we women, find our way. In other words, the nurse says, you got a problem, Phaedra. You are in love with your stepson, Hippolytus. It's not a great thing, but we all can't be strict. To that degree, in other words, I'll help you out. Don't worry about it. This will all be taken care of by me. I will serve as the go-between, if you will. Well, <clears throat> she goes to speak with Hippolytus. This is done off stage. It's kind of brilliant the way it's done because the chorus is chatting with Phaedra and Phaedra is obviously worried very much about how this exchange is going to go down. Ostensibly what the nurse is going to do is go to Hippolytus and say, hey listen, your stepmom is totally smitten for you. She needs you to love her. Please do that. Would you at least consider doing that? Phaedra will hear screaming off stage and she will immediately recognize things are not going well. And in fact, she recognizes that, oh, misery, she says, he's going not only to say no, he's going to say no, absolutely. Um, oh, misery, Phaedra says, oh, God, that such a thing should fall on me. And then she says it a little bit later, I'm undone. And she bends, that she bends towards the door and she, and she listens and then sinks away knowing this is not going to go well. Um, she, in fact, Phaedra will say, 
pender of sin, it's, uh, um, the voice says. Um, how canst thou hear in there, betrayer of a master's bed? In other words, she's hearing what Hippolytus is saying to the nurse, and what Hippolytus is saying to the nurse is, I would never betray my father's bed. In other words, he stands up absolutely no ways fully innocent of any suggestion that he would ever mess around or sleep with his father's wife, right? Um, she says it. I, I am slain. She thought to help me fall with love instead of honor and wrecked all. In other words, the nurse has not done what I had hoped that would happen. And in fact, now she says it. I am totally ruined. Hippolytus comes on stage, and this is really the heart of the play. Hippolytus comes on stage for the only major speech that he's actually given in the play. Again, it's kind of a misnomer to call this play Hippolytus for Euripides, because in the end, the play is actually going to focus more on poor Phaedra and the fact that she doesn't know what to do because she's so in love with Hippolytus. Hippolytus, the self-righteous man. Hippolytus, the man who loathes women. And it's and it's this set of lines that in fact lead many readers and viewers of this play to say, well, Euripides basically had it in for women right from the start. The speech that Hippolytus gives is worth, though, the language. Let's spend a few minutes with it. Notice the nurse says, oh, please be nice to me. Man was born to err. Oh, be nice to me. In other words, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Hippolytus will go off on a speech that forever in history has been used over and over again. Um, for those of you that know the, uh, the play My Fair Lady, for example, and, and there's a famous song in there about a guy who says that I will never let a woman in my life, much of it comes from these lines. Listen to what he says. Oh God, why hast thou made this gleaming snare woman to dog us on the happy earth? Was it thy will to make man? Why his birth through love and woman? In other words, if you had to make a man, why'd you have to do it with a woman involved? Could we not have rolled our store of prayer and offering royal gold, silver, and weight of bronze before thy feet and bought of God new child souls as were met for each man's sacrifice?